Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, tonight's webinar. Uh, as we're just getting set up and getting everything in order, I'm Martin Helgeson, working for Apologia Center for Christian Apologetics. I will be your host. I'm also the producer, so if I start looking around and you're like, and you start hearing a lot of clicks, that's because I'm setting up screen sharing or other things uh, that are required to run the webinar. Uh, so uh, the webinar will be in English tonight. Uh, you probably noticed that I'm speaking English. So for any international uh, listeners uh, on our YouTube channel or even now when we are live, uh, that always helps if I'm doing the introduction in English as well. Uh, so our topic is how the good news of Jesus became bad news. Uh, but also not just the historical aspect, but what can we do about it? Is there a way for us to recover the goodness of the Christian message and be able not just to feel convinced about it ourselves as Christians, but also share it with others. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to get to introduce to you all uh, Julia Garshagen. Um, hello, Julia. Um, hello. Julia joins us from uh, the city that some call Köln in Sweden, called Köln, just, just like you do. In English, they call it Cologne. I don't know. I don't know if it's if it smells better than most cities. Maybe that's why. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Well, uh, we'll go with Köln for uh, for Sweden yes. and German. And uh, Julia, you are the director of the Pontus Institute. Uh, it's it's called the Pontus Institute for Science, Culture, and Faith. So I'll guess. I'm sure you get this question all the time. Why the name Pontus? Well, Pontus is Latin for bridges. Uh, and that's pretty much what we do. So I think we're really partner organizations in, in spirit and uh, in mind as well. Uh, we are aiming to build bridges between the questions that people have, um, the intellectual questions, and then also uh, the Christian faith, because we we believe it's both fulfilling the heart and the mind, and we can ask all questions uh, towards the Christian faith. If Jesus is the truth, then I think he stands up to any test. So we can test. Um, and yeah, that's uh, mainly what I do. Um, I, I lead the Institute, which means um, I speak a lot at universities, in the business context, conferences. Um, I do quite a bit um, for, for younger people as well. We really want to reach the people who are thinking and who are out there and might wonder and have, have critical questions. So we want to go where they are at and, um, and meet them there. That's wonderful. Uh, would you share something you did in the last week or two weeks, like a highlight from uh, meeting uh, an audience somewhere and getting to interact with them? Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. I was in Mannheim, which is um, a university, well, at the university there, which is um, a university that focuses a lot on economics and had loads of questions with students who were quite far away, but very, very interested. Um, and uh, one of the guys was studying history, so he asked me for literature to look into the re reliability of the Gospels. Mm. And then actually last week he called me and said, um, you know, I've read all the material you gave to me within one week. Um, and I'm shocked. I'm absolutely shocked because as a historian, I had no idea how reliable the New Testament was. He said, we as historians... All the time we say we know things about the Gallic Wars or whatever, and we don't have any source that comes anywhere near to uh, the reliability of the gospel. So that was an amazing encounter. Oh, wow. uh, people, I was I was able to pray with a girl um, with, in the lecture hall in one of the uh, most atheistic parts of Germany. So, um, so yeah, I think the gospel is good news and we can tell it uh, and talk about it. That's great. That's great. That's wonderful. Uh, it yeah, you wish you would get those kinds of emails uh, every day, but that's, yeah. that's the highlight. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me, Tuzan <laughs> Um, Yeah, it's great to to be with you, and also uh, very much looking forward to the Q and A. Martin already mentioned, um, we will have a time of hearing your thoughts and your questions. Uh, so, yeah, I'll be. Uh, ready and eager to interact and hear your thoughts. Why do we not consider how the Christians' kindness to strangers, their concern for the burial of the dead, and the simplicity of their lifestyle have done so much to spread their message? It is shameful that among the Jews, 
which means the Christians as well. There are no beggars and the Christians support our poor as well as their own poor. This is a letter by the last pagan emperor of Rome by the name of Julian. And he was writing to his friend Ascasius in 360 AD. Basically, this emperor wanted to revive the cult to the pagan gods, but he had a little problem. The lies and the message of the Christians in the Roman Empire had become so att attractive that they started to outlive the pagans. Their message was simply too good to resist. Basically, what Jesus had predicted had happened. You are the light of the world, so let your light shine before the people so that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. And then from there, Christianity would obviously go on to transform the healthcare, the education, the politics, the economics, the science, the value systems, the relationships in the European continent and beyond, actually, in the world forever. For millions and millions of people, the liberating and transforming and justice-bringing message of Jesus Christ had truly become Evangelion, good news. And as we tonight are thinking about the current challenges we face as Christians, I wanted us to have this amazing perspective first. The Holy Spirit has transformed our continent once. I think he will do it again. The Holy Spirit is still alive and well. And one of my theological teachers always said, the Holy Spirit is the youngest among all of us, which means he's the most dy dy dynamic. God has not given up on Europe. Nevertheless, obviously, and Martin already hinted at that, the perception of Christianity has drastically changed. And I guess we've all come across that. The oyangelion has become the disangelion, the good news has often become perceived as bad news. Partly, and that's very paradoxically, that is because the Christian message has become so successful that most Westerners take its merits for granted and they don't trace it back to the origins of Christianity. But partly that's also because over the century, the church and Christians have not often done a very good job in representing Jesus to the world. We have fallen short of the good news that we proclaim. So the good news has become bad news. And I see that particularly in three areas. Firstly, for many people, it has become emotionally irrelevant. A friend of mine said to me the other day, I have a great family. I've got a good job, a nice house, hobbies, holidays. I go to Sweden. I am fulfilled. I don't need your God. I can be happy on my own. And I think for many people, that question of the meaning of life has already been answered. It is to be happy. Happiness is the meaning of life and our goal. And in the West, we go about happiness like we go about everything else. It's something you have to achieve. If you perform well enough, you will be happy. If you self-realize enough, if you find a good job and a great partner, an amazing career, the Swedish adventure, if you are fit enough and practice mindfulness, that will ultimately lead you to happiness. Happiness is there. You just have to achieve it. And in this whole equation, God is at best superfluous. But for some people I talk to quite a lot, actually, God can really be harmful because religion restricts you, hinders your personal development. So the good news has become emotionally irrelevant. And then secondly, for many people I talk to, the good news has also become intellectually deficient. I had a three hour conversations with a physics student about faith. He was very, very skeptical. And then we came to the point where I talked about the resurrection. I actually said to him, I believe in physical resurrection. He looked at me, eyes big open, and said, wow, up until just now, I thought you were actually somewhat intellectual. Well, I said, I'm only glad I was able to maintain that illusion for three hours, but well. And I think that is the conviction, the basic conviction that most Westerners hold. Science has long refuted religion and especially Christianity. Feuerbach's theory that religion is just an illusion, a, protect, a projection of our wishes into the sky is assumed. 
So that makes believers biased and unscientific and intellectually dishonest. And unfortunately, some churches sometimes reinforce that thought by a very biblical, unbiblical, sorry, unbiblical fear and a disregard of science. So for many scientific and intellectual thinkers, belief in God is not only something that is irrelevant, but is also hostile to facts and therefore harmful to science. It is intellectually bad news. And then thirdly, for many people, the good news has become morally questionable. And that is one of the biggest shifts that I have seen over the recent years, maybe decades. While I was speaking at, at German universities, a group distributed flyers. They warned against the local Christian, Christian union, the Christian group at the university, because, quote, they want to reinforce restrictive moral concepts and represent an attack on the freedoms that we have fought for in recent decades. So you see, in the past, many people said, I don't want to become a Christian because they have this very high moral standard and I'm not even going to try and reach it. But today, a lot of people say, I don't want to be a Christian because it's immoral to be a Christian. Christians have fought wars. They have help destroy indigenous cultures. And today, if you look at the church, it's hypocritical, judgmental, arrogant, homophobic, misogynist. They abuse children and power and money and don't care about climate change. Christians have bad morals. So to sum up, Christianity has for many people become emotionally irrelevant, intellectually deficient, and morally questionable. And that is for many people true for the individual but then also for society. So both the individual and the society would be better off if the Christian influence could be just done away with. You see, most people who oppose Christianity, they're not bad people. They want the good, but they simply don't find that in Christianity. So that means that when we talk to people about the gospel, when we when we preach or, you know, just have a conversation with our work colleagues, quite often we don't start at point zero. We often start at my, minus five or maybe even minus ten. For many of our contemporaries, the good news is actually far away from being good news. Now, you might say, well, that's not a new thing. Even in the first century, the Apostle Paul writes that the good news is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greek. Yes, but in my perception, this today is not only even true for non-Christians, it's also a lot of Christians who don't really know why the good news would be good news for the individual and the society. Yes, Maybe Jesus is nice on a very personal level and, you know, I feel warm about it. But um, when it comes to the question whether the good news is good news for their neighbours and their colleagues and their politics and business and education, most Christians I talk to don't have any ideas why that should be the case. So then why should we talk about the gospel to others? Um, one, one person I talked to said, I don't dare to speak to my colleague about my Christian faith, because I sometimes feel brainwashed. It is as if I have a contagious disease that I need to hide. Don't know whether you have felt like that before. I think it is a serious question that we all need to wrestle with. How can we talk about the good news so that it is really perceived as good news for the society and for the individual? What is actually so good about the good news? How can we live a life and proclaim a gospel that people in the 21st century understand Jesus is not just not irrelevant. He is actually the best news ever, which is what I think. <laughs> so in the remaining 20 minutes or so, I will, I will be able to give you a full answer that will transform your life and your preaching of the gospel and all your gospel initiatives, unfortunately not, sorry, <laughs> um, obviously not. But what I would like to do is to share some thoughts and ideas that hopefully 
can inspire conversation and and further thinking and then obviously you need to think about how what does that mean in my own context in my workplace and my family in the circle of friends where I'm in all right so I think the first thing we really really need if we want to show to other people and to the world that the good news is good news is we need humility I'm an evangelist and an apologist so I can't even begin to give a talk without a reference to 1 Peter 3.15, which is sort of the underlying verse for apologetics. (laughs) And Peter there writes, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But, and this is the important part, do this with gentleness and respect. Well, they're both important, but what I'm aiming here is the gentleness and the respect part. I think to show that the good news is good news for our society and for the individual, we need humility. And I think part of having humility is asking the question, where does the criticism that we receive hold up a mirror to to us? What can we actually learn from it? I think we need to acknowledge, yes, often Christians, the church, we, I myself, we haven't represented Jesus well. Yes, we made many mistakes. And yes, unfortunately, very often we are not so much part of the remedy, but very often we are part of the problem. And yes, sometimes we misunderstand and we judge our culture very, very quickly. I think it's key to acknowledge these shortfalls. And and maybe even if you can, to apologize for it. Sometimes the best apologetics is an apology. I was preaching at a baptism and um, it was basically a whole room full of atheists (laughs) And um, and in my preaching, I mentioned the shortfalls of the church, especially um, around the topic of sexual violence, because that is a very big issue in my city of Köln. And then afterwards, a couple came to me and they introduced themselves as atheists. I said, it's been 40 years since we set a, a foot into a church. And then they said, but we were so surprised. We were just completely taken off guard by what you said, because we would have never thought that we would hear a criticism of a church in preaching. Thank you so much for doing this. And then from there on developed a very personal conversation about their experience with Christians and the hypocrisy that they had experienced and how Christians were not really open for criticism. And I actually said to them, I am really, really sorry. I'm a Christian, so please, can I apologize? That really opened the door for them. We need to acknowledge that, yes, wrong things have happened. And I think we need to also acknowledge that for many people, where the criticism of Christianity comes a very strong concern for justice. We need to show, yes, we are aware of your pain. And and we want to take your justified objections and concerns serious. We really, really want to listen well. We want to hear. There's much more to say about that topic. This is just, again, a conversation opener. We need humility. But I also think we need courage. We need the courage to talk about the hope that is in us, to tell the hopeful story of God with his world and his people and how it inspires every aspect of our life and our society. The psychologist Glenn Harrison says, we need to tell the better story. We need to tell the better story. And I think we need courage to tell the better story. In doing so, I think it would be wise to stress three things. Firstly, the power of the gospel. Secondly, the truth of the gospel. And thirdly, the beauty of the gospel. So firstly, the power of the gospel. Why is the gospel emotionally fulfilling? You see, postmodern people are very pragmatic. In their pursuit of happiness, they ask the question, what is helpful? 
what is relevant and what can contribute to my well-being. And in the evangelical world, I have often seen two ways of answering that question. The first one is what I want to call the theological correct gospel. And the cor theologically correct gospel would say, wow, to ask how God can be helpful is actually the wrong question. That's a very utilitarian approach. You have to focus on the fact that God is a sinner. We all deserve God's punishment. Jesus died for us. He took our punishment. We are free from sin. Happy us. Well, yeah, that's true. And I will be forever thankful for the cross. But the problem is that this doesn't connect to the questions that most people ask. Most people, even in Germany, don't even ask Luther's questions of how can I get a merciful God anymore. I was talking to an agnostic the other day and he said, I know you Christians, your answer to every question is, you are a sinner, Jesus died for you. That's nice, but it doesn't help me in my everyday problems. It doesn't mean anything to me. Surely he had heard theologically correct presentations of the gospel, but for him, they were pale and powerless because they didn't connect to his world and to his, his questions, so it wasn't good news at all. And then secondly, the second way that is sometimes you know, walked in the evangelical world is what I call the happiness gospel. The happiness gospel goes like this. You know, the problem of our society is that it points to the wrong way to happiness. The way to happiness, to have happiness in life, is not career or fitness or sex or money. The true way to happiness is actually Jesus. If you pray enough, if you believe strongly enough, if you read your Bible enough, God is going to give you a good life. He will fulfill you because that's what the Bible says. Well, maybe I'm caricaturing a little bit, but have you ever heard something along those lines? I call that the happiness gospel because I think it's the Western version of prosperity gospel. And the happiness gospel takes the question of the individual very serious. But then I think it just baptized the zeitgeist. It says, yes, the true meaning of life is happiness. And a fulfilled life is your ultimate goal. But we're going to show you a different way to the same aim. And that is Jesus. So I basically just sugarcoat put some Christian sugar coating to what the world is actually saying. I often talk to people who, who hear that gospel and then feel very, very pressured. It leaves them very disappointed. And they come to me and say, well, I've tried this Jesus way to happiness, but it doesn't work. I'm still not blissfully happy. I think the good news of Jesus points to a third direction, and it so often does that. It points to a much more revolutionary power. It's much more provocating, but also much more liberating. The good news is the happiness is not the ultimate aim in our life and Jesus' way to get there. But that Jesus is actually the ultimate goal and happiness can be a byproduct on its way. Sometimes we will be blissfully happy because we follow Jesus, but sometimes we won't, despite or maybe even because we follow Jesus. You see, Jesus promises the fullness of life, and that word in Hebrew actually invokes the fullness, the wholeness of life. So the whole life, which means Yes, the mountains of joy, but also the dark valleys and the every light day life between. Jesus speaks his divine presence into all of life. He speaks life into every moment of our life. So that means no moment is wasted or meaningless, not the boredom and the normality of every day that don't put on Instagram, nor the shameful or painful moments that could eliminate. Jesus speaks me in the happiness race. This is the powerfully liberating good news that our society needs. 
And that is an amazing meaning. It's a meaning we don't need to strive for, but a meaning that is given to us by God, who celebrates our joys and weaves his golden threads into our every life and carries us in our difficulties. He is power to transform everything. Just before we had this call, I was talking to my friend Marina from Ukraine. And um, she's a Christian. She decided to stay in Ukraine to serve people there. She's just been to Kharkiv to, um, yeah, to be with with people there and and um, be a translator for counselors, trauma counselors. And I asked her, Marina, how do you stand? Like, what gives you the power to go into these places? And she says, Yes, I am afraid, and God doesn't just take that all away. But when I pray. I experience this amazing transformative peace that gives me the freedom to go into these places to help people because I know God is with me. And even if I die, I know I will be with him. That is an amazing power that can transform everything. And it is our privilege to show to society that this is a meaning that makes a difference on Mondays at workplace, in the next crisis we, we may face, and in the glories of life that we have never even dreamt of. Secondly, the truth of the gospel. Why is the good news intellectually inspiring? I was talking to a young academic, and, um, and he asked questions for about seven hours all about Jesus. He wanted to know it all. And then by the end of those seven hours, he said to me, you know what, Julia, the story of Jesus is the most beautiful thing I have ever heard. And now I need to find out whether it's true. So you see, the first question that postmodern people ask is not the question of truth, but they also don't want to shut off their brain. Uh, I read a Swiss study um, among young people who'd left their church. And one of the main reasons why they left their church uh, was that they said there was no room to ask questions and no room to voice doubts. And there was no relation between science and faith. I think the times when apologetics was only th something for a few brainy people who work at Apologia is in the past. In fact, I think there was never a time like that. First Peter, the letter, urges us all to have an apologia, an answer, and it is written to the whole church. So I think we need to show and to talk about how we can become and remain Christians, a thinking people in the 21st century, how our faith is actually grounded in reason. After all, God called us to love him, with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind, our understanding. Why is Christianity the most intellectually inspiring worldview? I think it is the best story. Also intellectually, it's, it's a mystery that you can dive into and ask deeper and deeper questions. I think apologetics is something, it's, it's actually pastoral care for the mind. Is pastoral care for the mind. For non-Christians, it shows that faith is not blind faith, that is actually well-founded trust. And for Christians, it gives reassurance. It deepens our, our understanding of the truth of Christ. So I think we need a renewal of cultural apologetics as well. Karl Barth, who was a Swiss theologian, famously said, we need to hold the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, and then read one through the lenses of the other. I believe if Jesus is the truth, as I said, he brings good news to every sphere of society. The other thing is that we need to keep in mind is that when it comes to the postmodern understanding of truth, there's also a very interesting shift over the last few years, because very slowly we are seeing the negative social effects of the view that truth is only relative and subjective. So in his editorial letter in December 2018, that's already some time ago, William Falk, the editor of the Newsweek, which is an American English uh, weekly magazine, um, he complained about the danger or wrote about the danger.
danger of disinformation and alternative facts. And he says, I may be naively optimistic, but my wish for 2019 is that the world word of the year will be truth. A commitment to objective truth from a renowned journalist is something that would have been unthinkable only a few years before. Postmodern philosophers have often criticized the claim to absolute truth as a claim to power that has led to abuse. And I think it's very important that we take that into account when we talk about Jesus. But we are today also witnessing the consequences of relativism, how in the op absence of objective truth, those who speak their truth the loudest the most affluent ones who can afford to present alternative facts with their own media channels gain power over the weaker and the quieter and the marginalized. So relativism has actually not guaranteed less power struggle, but actually much more power struggle. And again, the truth of Jesus shows a third way. Because Jesus combines objective and personal truth like no one else does. Yes, he is objective and all-encompassing truth. He gives an objective moral standard that the marginalized and the victims can appeal to no matter what all the others say. But he's also truth in person. He's not a set of dogmas that we can put down someone's throat. He is a truth that we can get to know personally by entering into a relationship. And that is very postmodern. We can explore, is he truthfully, is he trustworthy? Jesus is the truth in person, who instead of climbing the ladder of power, kneels down to wash the, friends of, of his, uh, the feet of his friend. And instead of raising an army, he was raised on a cross. The power of Jesus' truth is actually revealed in weakness. And there's so much beauty about it. As one theologian once said, I don't hold the truth, but the truth holds me. And this truth is not about being right. It's about loving. And that is right. And that will transform people. And then thirdly, the beauty of the gospel. Why is the good news morally good? I was um, sharing a room with a friend of mine and um, as you know, the sun said it was all really dark. Suddenly from the other, other corner of the room, she said to me, Julia, I need to tell you the thing that I'm most ashamed of. And I was like, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> it's a time for revelation. And then she said, the thing I am, or my biggest shame in life is that I had never sex with a man and I'm already 33, year, 33 years old. And my feeling is, that in our society, sexuality actually defines our status and it defines our identity. I thanked her so much and, and felt really honored by her honesty. And then I said to her, you know, I think actually in our society, we don't appreciate sex too much. I actually think we don't appreciate it enough. I think it's so much more precious than we make it appear. Because actually, I think it's a reflection of the unconditional self-giving love of God. It's this love that he offers to us. And that is actually a firm foundation of our identity, regardless of how many sexual partners you had. And then from that corner, the dark corner of, uh, of the room, she said, Julia, this is the most beautiful thing I have ever heard. In her book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, the secular feminist and author Luz Perry comes to a very similar conclusion. She's not a Christian, she is a secular feminist. And she describes how for biological reasons, women have actually less drive to have different sexual partners and to leading a promiscuous life. And she comes to the conclusion that actually this promiscuous lifestyle of our modern society is harmful to women. She says, from a feminist point of view, the sexual revolution was actually anti-women. And then she comes to her conclusion in the last chapter and says, the traditional Judeo-Christian view of marriage is actually the only ethic where 
the sexual ethics is accommodated according to the female sexual needs. And she says how therefore it is good news for women. I think that is such a beautiful way of showing how the good news is morally good, especially for the mar marginalized. And that Christian ethics, yes, make a society flourish. I think in order to show the beauty of the good news, we need to ask the question, what is the good aim behind an opinion that someone else voices? You see, most people, as I already said, want the good. They don't have bad morals or they don't think they have bad morals. Feminists want to protect women's rights. And that's great because for centuries, women have been marginalized and limited and often the church has played a role in that. Or someone who says all religions lead to the same God often longs for harmony and peace in society. And religions have often caused conflict and war. And therefore they say, well, you know, if all religions agree that the same God, they wouldn't have to argue and start wars anymore. But you see, the empowerment of women and harmony and peace in our society, they are both gospel values. They're amazing aims that we can well you from a biblical point of view. And we can say, hey, we have the same aim. We sit in the same boat. Let's think together what the best way to get to that aim is. And then our task is to show why in order to have more equality and a more peaceful society, we don't need less of Jesus, as people often think, but we actually need more of Jesus because it is his unconditional love that brings dignity to everyone while at the same time sets up healthy boundaries for tolerance that we need to protect the weak against the strong and the victims against the perpetrators. So in my opinion, yes, the gospel is morally good for the individual and for the society in the 21st century. I think it is emotionally fulfilling. It is intellectually inspiring. It is morally beautiful. And that's why we can show the power and the truth and the beauty of the gospel. Yes, that is a challenge. We will need our brains and our praise and our experience and the wisdom of the whole Christian community in Sweden and Germany and everywhere else. We need to come together as we're doing it tonight to think and, and pray through issues and listen to the Lord. Yes, it is a challenge, but it's also the privilege of our lifetime. We live in exciting times. We have good news that is power and truth and beauty to transform our whole continent. It has happened before. I'm sure it can happen again because God has not given up on Europe. His good news is still the best news ever. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Julia. Uh, wow, you managed to cover a lot of ground. Uh in such a short space of time. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have our first uh, question coming in. It's mm -hmm. it's an anonymous question, but it already has two thumbs up. So I have a sure it's a good one. Um, a lot of people today call Christians homophobic uh, and transphobic and therefore morally evil. How can I give a humble yet true answer to that? Yeah, thank you so much. That is obviously one of the, um, yeah, a big one and uh, a very difficult one. And I think um, you're so right to point it out to, you know, how can we give a humble answer? Because um, a lot of people I talk to who are um, homosexual have actually experienced quite a lot of hurt from Christians. So my first approach would always be to acknowledge that, maybe to even ask, um, have you experienced something like that? And and if so, as I said before, I do sometimes say, um, well, I always say I'm really sorry because I am sorry. And I sometimes say to people, you know, I'm a Christian. I know I haven't done this and we can't really apologize for other people. But on the behalf of, of the church, can I please ask for forgiveness? Because I really don't think this is um, the Jesus way of how to how to treat people. And then. I would always want to point to the fact that Jesus is the most in a way, inclusive person that has ever been on this earth. I mean, his, his love is unconditional for everyone. And you don't, we don't need to change before we come to him, but um, we just need to say yes and receive that grace. 
And that will change us in some ways that we might have never thought of, thought of. It will change all of us. Um, but but you know, we we don't know yet what what that what that means. Um I have a good friend who um was a gay activist, and that is a story I actually sometimes or quite often talk to people, uh, tell people. So um he was a gay activist, he was very hurt by the church and therefore very anti-Christian. And then um he was at a pub in Sydney, and you know, long story short, he met this girl who prayed um with him to to meet Jesus and to receive his love. And he did. I mean, in a pub in Sydney, Jesus really revealed himself to him. And until today, he can't, you know, he can't talk about it without crying. So it was like this oil of love that was poured over me. He's quite charismatic. <laughs> and um and then he said, oh wow, now uh possibly I have to become a Christian. And oh now I have to join this church thing. Oh no, I didn't want that. But but he said I have never ever experienced anything like it in my life. And I realized this was the love I'd always search for in every relationship. And then um, he went on this very interesting journey because first he thought, okay, then um, then I, 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 I'll marry someone, gay marriage. I mean, you know, yeah, Jesus talks about, you know, marriage, so let's do gay marriage. And then eventually from reading the scriptures and studying it, he said, um, I have come to believe that. I don't think that is in the will of God. So he's now a celibate. He um, he very, very openly calls himself gay and as part of the gay community, but he lives as a celibate. And I, I don't, I hardly know anyone who is so full of the love and grace and inspiration of God. And just to hear him talk about Jesus, the most amazing thing. His name is David Bennett and his book is A War of Love. So if you want to go and read it, I think um, it's, it's really a good resource. Um, why I'm telling this story is because it's always personal. This question is always a personal so uh, question and a, and a yeah, very emotional question. So especially when I talk to someone who's not a Christian, I don't want to, you know, throw dogmas at them that will not make sense. My friend David says the the question of homosexuality as all sexual questions and ethical questions is not a question is not um it's not an evangelism issue it's a discipleship issue because it's not going to make any sense whatsoever to someone who hasn't known the love of God and they will not have the strength to even think about celibacy if they don't know Jesus so um I don't know whether that helps, but that would be sort of my way in. There's loads that could be said about the uh, the task of the church, <laughs> um, because uh, if we think that people who feel homos like ha are homosexual um, should stay celibates, then we are to be their family. Uh, we are to provide. So you know, it's it's it invites all of us, and I think sometimes that sort of um, it's not really seen, and I would really love to bring that to the intention uh, of people. Yeah, I don't yeah. know whether you want to add to that. No, that makes a lot of sense. We have another question here, um, uh, which uh, touches on similar uh, things here with uh, from Thomas and Mia. Thanks for an inspiring talk. I think the moral issue might be the biggest one in Sweden right now. Yeah, can you elaborate on how to handle that? And so I think you mentioned. Uh, the the value of acknowledging failures of Christians. And then I think it's really crucial uh, what you said about not expecting uh, unbelievers to live up to Christian standards before they've encountered Christ, right? And they go together a little bit because once you realize as Christians, we have been hypocritical, we have failed to live up to that standard, mm. then it becomes very unreasonable to expect others to, to meet a standard we haven't ourselves, right? That's right. It's kind of step one and two a little bit is is acknowledging our own failures and then, uh, um, but how have you um, have you um, in in conversation with people have you, I guess, kind of directly explicitly told them you know well okay so that's a moral question but you need to like how would you help people move from their ethical moral question to the person of Jesus, I guess, is my question uh, as a follow-up. 
yeah. uh, because that's where we want to get them. And then we can come back perhaps to the moral question. But yeah. it, you don't want to be rude, I guess, to say, no, you're asking the wrong question. Uh, well, yeah, and I don't think they are. I don't think yeah. they're asking the wrong question because especially when you look at the, the topic of justice and uh, most of these moral questions are actually related to or linked to justice. Justice is the aim behind it. We need justice for the marginalized and justice for those who, for the minority groups. Um, so I always want to acknowledge the good aim be behind the opinion. And that is maybe the third, you know, you mentioned asking good questions and, um, and, and acknowledging things and being, being humble. But I think a third thing for me would be to always find out what is the good aim behind the opinion of a person. And um, and I, as I said, when I meet, for example, feminists, it is justice for, for women. And yeah. that is so much a gosh, gospel issue. And it's so easy to link that to Jesus because I can say, wow, you know, one of the most amazing feminists I know is actually Jesus. And boom, you're there. And you can, you can talk about how Jesus was so kind to culture in his time. Or when you, you know, when it comes to the question of sexuality, I want to say, as I said to my friend, you know, I don't think we take sexuality we value it too much. I don't think we value it enough. And, and then how it, it's actually a signpost to the person of Christ and, and how God relates to us in the unconditional love. So I want to take all these longings that people have and and really ask, ask for the longings behind people's opinions and then show how they are actually a signpost to God, because I think that is ultimately true. You know, take climate change, for example. Again, it's a question of justice. Um, it's obviously a question of caring for the environment. Boom, you're that first pages of the Bible. That's the first command God gives us. Uh, and, and then we have this amazing hope how God will transform this world. You know, he's not going to take us up to sky and we're going to be angels on, on a cloud. No, no, no. He mm. will transform this world. And that is an amazing real buddy yeah, it's, it's an amazing hope. And I actually talk to people about that and they often go like, wow, I'm not religious, but that is the most beautiful hope I've ever heard of. Um, so, so I think I'm not saying it's easy and it's not like this is the only re reaction I get to from people, obviously I'm talking about the highlights, um, but mm -hmm. I think it is possible to enter into this dialogue on eye level and um, when we take the other person serious and, and we don't know them, we need to ask the questions and then and then cherish the good. That's a biblical perspective. Cherish the good that we find. And then, OK, you want peace or you want justice. What's your way to it? To end this, I was um, I was in Poland, I think, last month, and there was a trans person. Um, listening to the lecture and then I got talking to her afterwards and again she hadn't experienced a lot from Christians but her partner had um, and and then she said but you know I'm realizing in my activism it very very easily turns into hatred to other people and I, I start hating people who are not on my side so to say so I'm realizing I need something more than tolerance and then she pointed to her friend who brought her to, to the, the event and, she, and said, you know, when I met Ola, I was shocked. I was shocked because I have never, ever met a person who loves me so much and he is who is so supportive of me and she's a Christian. Hmm. So he is a person who was actually able to live out the good news and to show Yes, I, I love you. And that's why she then came to the event and that's why she heard about Jesus. And, you know, it's this sort of long line. And, you know, she I don't think she was ready to give her life to Christ the next day. But um, but we also need to give room for God to work in people's lives slowly, slowly, uh, because we don't start at zero. We start at minus, minus 10 often. But I think, you know, God has this story with everyone we talk to. Yeah.
Sorry, yeah. was that anywhere near to the question you asked? <laughs> yes, yes, very much. Thank you. So yeah, we, there's a lot of good there uh, to to like take away about like affirming the good. Uh, mm -hmm. I really love your emphasis on that and the fact that we we need to make sure we're not uh, so that we're not you know what well, I wonder what this phrase is in English when when Paul says to you know meet evil with good uh, or to even yeah. uh, become evil um yeah. with the good and it's so easy for us to maybe to just end up in a trench uh, across and we're just kind of debating or uh, uh you know you get into the cu culture war kind of mindset and it's so important yeah. to, to show people that we we're serious about loving them let's uh get into questions of happiness uh, which I thought was one of the really interesting things that you you mentioned here. And so uh, let's start with Johanna's question. Can you say anything more about how to engage people who say that they are fulfilled with their secular life? How can we challenge the idea that happiness is the meaning of life? Mm. So happy yeah. and different Scandinavian people <laughs> who, are, <laughs> who are kind of, according to some, famous for that state of mind. Uh, you know, some of the ha happiest countries in the world and also some of the more secular ones. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think um, Germany and 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 Switzerland follow right after you. I don't know right. in terms of happiness, mm -hmm. but in terms of secularity, um, yeah. definitely. So um, I have a few strategies, and um, I can't say one always works or they both always work or whatever. But so one thing is. Um, I want to point out the fragility of that because, um, you know, we all, we all, like crisis will come. <laughs> and it's for me actually quite interesting. When I talk to students, that is something that doesn't go down very well because most of them have not had a lot of life experience and some of them have got through a life that is amazing and great. So, but then when they become a bit older, um, most people actually realize, oh yeah, there's more a crisis will come. Um, so it was a question for, that was very... Um, you cut out for 20 seconds. Could you, uh, could you go uh, back a little bit? And sorry. Connection carries. Sorry, this is um, the amazing German internet. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so... So I want to go, I want to ask two questions, maybe. Uh, one is, will happiness prevail? Because we all know crisis will hit one day. And, you know, even if it is the ultimate meaninglessness of our existence, which is death. Um, and that was uh, something that really came up during the corona crisis. I know you guys in Sweden had a very different way of dealing with it. So maybe uh, it wasn't that obvious um, in, in Sweden, but it was very much in my context. Um, that's And many people said, you know, all of a sudden, like everything I built my life on, my happiness just dissolved within within. Uh, a few weeks because of lockdown and things like that. So that is one way I want to go um, go into. But then obviously it can also be a bit immoral to um, you know to talk people into a problem they didn't have before in order to then um, give them a solution to the problem they didn't have before. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. not. I, I said this as the first answer, but I'm not not normally going down that route for like that's what. That's not my first route. Um, then the other thing is, I say, well, it's amazing. I, you know, congratulations that you have such a, a great life. But what if there was more? What if there was so much more to life? C.S. Lewis has got this amazing quote where he says, um, the God of the universe wouldn't think that our ambitions and our wishes are too, you know, too big he would think they're actually too shallow. And he says, we are like little children who play in the mud while actually um, a holiday at the sea or in the Swedish yeah. fjord is on offer. Um, so, so he basically turns this around and says, great, you have a great life, but what if there was more meaning and more depth than you'd ever think thought of? Um, and... And C.S. Lewis is a great person for that. He says, um, I didn't go into Christianity um, 
to make me happy. Uh, I, I, I always knew a bottle of pork could do that. <laughs> so then you have a third question that comes in and that's the question of truth. Like what if it was true? Um, and obviously that's not a very postmodern question. That is a modern question, but I do sometimes bring it up. Um, if it was true, then uh, never mind whether it makes you happy or not. This is the foundation of, of this universe. And, and what if you could explore this? What if you could come into contact with the person who made this whole universe? Like you can, you know, you can really elaborate on that. And then there's a fourth question that I sometimes um, ask people when I want to be really cheeky. And I'm not sure whether that's theologically correct, but I think in a way it is. So it's I cheek, say, that's a theological virtue. I don't know. But... <laughs> so I say, well, maybe you don't need God, but what if God needs you? Uh, what he need, If he needs you so much that he was actually ready to give his life for you? Um and what if he needs you to come on his team and and make a difference in this life? Um, I I don't come from a Christian family, and one of the things that always attracted me to Jesus was that he gave me the chance to be part of something bigger and to be part of something that has eternal value. Because the people who have found their happiness are often the achieving people. And, you know, they, they really want to do stuff and they can do amazing things. But again, following that, what if, what if there was more? What if God actually made you part of a team that is way bigger than you and you could contribute to something um, with eternal value? Eternal sometimes is not a word that I would use in a secular context, but yeah. Mm, yeah, thanks. Um, relating to, to happiness question is this one from Agnes, which I think is interesting and, and quite tricky. So, um, can you elaborate on how to avoid the happiness gospel while evangelizing when, for example, telling a personal testimony of being delivered from anxiety, or should we avoid telling those kinds of testimonies to unbelievers? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I think that is such a good question and it's so good to be aware of that. Now, um, here's my my humble answer. I think it's great to tell testimonies. I think it really is. What I want to do is I want to say, you know, this is my story with Jesus. And then maybe here's Zakir's story or the women, woman at the well story or Martin's story. And... And now the invitation is come and meet Jesus and find out what he's going to do in your life. I can't promise you he's going to deliver you from all your anxiety in the way he did to me. But I know he promised he will make a difference to your life. So I think that's what we can say. Mm. Um, but um, but that's like I, I want to I want to invite people into this relationship to God and say, come and see, come and find out. Um, I often also um, uh, give away the the, um, the skeptic's prayer, which is, God, if you're there, show it, show yourself to me. And I think God does because he is a personal God. Now, he he's not always going to, you know, switch on the light at once and, and everything is going to be amazing. But, um, and, and that's something I, I sometimes say to people, um, but I know he he will come into your life and he will bring change. Now that might take years, that might take a minute. I know it's in his power, but um but his love will will change you mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's helpful. So it's important to not over promise or to give guarantees that we don't really have the basis of giving. Um, yeah, but I think we have we can give the guarantee that God God will meet someone. Now, sometimes yeah. I do speak to people who said, I've prayed and prayed and um, and God has never shown himself to me. And that is a big question for me. Um, but then sometimes I can say, oh, so what would you expect as yeah. a revelation from God? And the other day I had someone who said, well, uh, he would have to show up as a person in front of me. Like, And I'm like, oh, wow, okay, <laughs> let's look into uh, free will. And is that really God's way of overwhelming you? Because that right. could way through so um then you can you can ask 
you know, the question of what would you expect, accept as a revelation from God. But um, yeah. I think we can, we can promise that God is going to meet the person in time. Yeah. So um, I'm going to take the liberty to sneak in a question of my own. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a bit vague, but I would just love for you to elaborate. You mentioned how sometimes it is part of our good news that happiness is not the goal. So there's a form of liberation that we can offer people from the pursuit of happiness, mm. which I thought is really interesting. So could you, uh, I don't know, could I just ask you in general to expand on that a little bit? Because I do think sometimes there is part of this issue of anxiety and wanting to share those testimonies is that we kind of, there's this unquestioned happiness norm in our culture. Yes. Um, and as Christians, we can sometimes fail to question that norm. And yeah. so to fit our gospel into that norm rather than questioning it. And, and we could actually have people at, at our doorstep of the church or of our personal life um, who are kind of crushed by the happiness norm and they're not living up to it. So exactly. how would you go about liberating people from that mm -hmm. kind of almost like the cramp of you know, I have to be happy. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. I think it's very important you're pointing that out. I love the the phrase happiness norm. Um, there's a Belgium a professor of ethics who called it the imperative to be happy. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's sort of his analysis that in our culture, we have this imperative, you need to be happy. And then you have all these ways of, you know, this is how you can become happy. And, and basically, you know, we have metriocracy, like this culture of achievement transformed to every aspect of our life. So this is now in the realm of happiness as well. And, um, I read an article in The Guardian by a British neurologist, and he said this is actually really, really harmful um, because it it gives the impression that happiness is just there for anyone who knows the right pin. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it just completely leaves out the fact that there are circumstances for many people um, who, yeah, who just prevent them from achieving this happiness goal so it's not just us christians who are sort of questioning that it is secular thinkers and scientists yeah. and philosophers who who are looking at this you know it's this treadmill of you've got to be happy otherwise your life has failed um and then i love this phrase in john 10 by jesus who says i have come to give you life to the fullness um and I talked to oh, a friend of mine, talked to a Jewish rabbi, and he explained about this Hebrew word. Obviously, it's written in Greek, but, you know, he translated it back to Hebrew. He says, this encompasses the fullness of life. So in your ups and downs and in, you know, the everyday life between Jesus speaks life into this. And what I mean by this and or what I found so beautiful about this is that when I know God, it means that my happy moments have even more meaning. So the other day I talked to someone who said, um, you know, the great thing for me about God is that when I walk to, through the Swiss Alps or maybe the, the Swedish fjords and have these amazing times, I always think I know the maker of it all and I can talk to him about what I see and and that makes it so much more meaningful. And I was like, wow, that, that is actually such an add to our happy moments because also what psychology tells us is that happiness is obviously something that is really, you know, like fluent, like it, it's it's going to go away very soon. Um, just, you know, from how we are, we are built. Um, but but there's this, you know, there's so much, again, there's so much more to it. We can relate to the maker of all happiness. And then obviously in our darkest moment, there is someone who will carry us through. And even if, you know, even if we face death, we know that is not going to be the end because God is carry us through and, 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 and take us into new life. And that is actually also something very interesting, a German... Um, sociologist he's one of the most famous German sociologists at the time um his name is Hartmut Rosa and he wrote about how our um well everything becoming 
um, quicker and quicker and, you know, this sort of treadmill. Mm -hmm. He said that is actually, uh, actually comes from the fact that people have lost sight of eternity. He's not a Christian, but he says, we have to cram everything into out the 70 or 80 years that we have. So our all our happiness has to go into these, these few mm. years. And actually, he says, we have therefore lost resilience. We're not resilient in crisis because we always think, oh, but we need this happiness. And now I'm here and this is really awful and I'm, you know, wasting my time. So, um, so he says, cultures who still have that view of eternity are much more resilient because they can deal with dark moments better because they know ultimately this is not the end of everything mm -hmm. And and I have a deeper meaning than just overcoming this time. I mean, we all want to overcome it, based obviously, but um, yeah, it gives you a different view of it. And then in the everyday sort of moments, to be honest, I really find so much meaning in knowing that wherever I go, God is there with me and he has prepared things and he's in the little details. So, you know, when I'm writing emails, yeah, that can be boring. And it's not going to, it's not something that I can post on my Instagram. Well, maybe you can, but, <laughs> um, but, but um, I do it for God. Like everything you do, do it unto the Lord. I think that gives so much more meaning into our every life everyday life tasks that we need to do and that you know don't really give much happiness to us so mm -hmm. um so th so there's so much more and i think it, what jesus does as i said is just like really taking this this is your pursuit of happiness is your main goal he says no no i'm your main goal and 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 i'm that ah, and it's in this relationship when you look at positive psychology um they actually say that the between happiness and relationships, stable relationships, is best. And again, you're back at the Christian message because yes, we know God has made us for relationship to ourselves, to others, to this earth, and to God. And and He's the most stable because that's a relationship that will prevail mm. uh, even death. I don't know. Does that is that helpful? Yeah. Sounds yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um... So I'll, I'll let Sara uh, ask the final question for tonight. And um, so she says, thank you. How do you take initiative to, uh, to a conversation with a person who you assume think the good news are irrelevant or bad news? So I guess, you know, we, it, we've we covered uh, the good news, bad news part, but just the initiative is what I wanted. If you would uh, be able to say something about it so we could end there. So, so. Mm -hmm. Like how how do you initiate questions? We as public speakers, we have the luxury of people sometimes coming to us after we've given a presentation. But do you have any tips or pointers for actually initiating yeah. conversations? Yes, I think um, ask questions. I think the best way to evangelize is by asking questions. We need to become askers of good questions, and. Um, and the first thing I want to talk to people about if I meet them, you know, I don't know whether this person refers to someone they already know quite well, but you, you want to you wanna get to know people and and then you can you can go deeper. And as Christians, we are quite good. We can ask good questions about, you know, what do you like? And then we also may be good at going to a bit of a deeper level and, you know, but um, but then try and find questions that would bring you to an even deeper level, what I, I call a theological level. And then the God question, I'm going to give you an example. So I was, um, I studied in London for some time and lived in, um, in a shared flat. And, um, so when I moved in, uh, one of my housemates told me he was studying law. So I said, okay, this is, uh, that's great. What's your, like your particular interest in law. And mm -hmm. he said, human rights, I really, you know, I'm really all for human rights. I, I want to do a master's that is focused on human rights. And again, I said, oh, great. Um, I think that's, you know, an amazing topic. You obviously want to well you and and, and um, bring up uh, further thoughts. And then I said, um, so what is so interesting for you about human rights? And he said, well, you, you know, I think, um, I think it's this, share dignity that we all have that I find so interesting and so life-giving and and then I said um 
yeah, you know, I obviously I agree on those things. Uh, and then I said, so where do you think does that dignity come from? Where do you think do we get this um this sense that we all you know have have dignity and that we all actually inherit human rights? And then he started um, talking about evolution and um, uh, yeah. And then I said to him, you know, I'm I'm doing theology obviously, and um, I'm doing some uh, some philosophy as well with it. And most philosophers philosophers would actually say that it's actually really hard to um, to reason for shared human rights or even a human dignity that every human being inherits without someone who like is morally superior, like mm. without an objective moral law giver, without someone who gave this to us. And he looked at me while he, you know, he was cutting his cucumbers or whatever. And then he said, do you mean God? And I said, well, I believe in God. What What do you think? And he didn't. He was an atheist. Um, but it it just opened up this conversation. Now he didn't kneel down in uh, in the kitchen and received Christ on that day. And I, you know, I've lost lost touch, so I don't know whether he ever did. But um, but it was definitely a way in. And then we had this short conversation about what he thought and what I thought. And then I left it there. So I think it's also important. I think we need to become interesting people so that people ask questions and. And um, and then we can try to bring in the gospel and, and just build these bridges to to different topics. If someone is really creative, well, where does creativity come from? And, you know, what do you celebrate it about it? So so really try to ask these deeper questions that will be relevant to the person and listen well to them as well. And then I think I think actually it's all about prayer. Pray for God to give you the wisdom I often don't I often lie in bed afterwards and oh if only I had said this <laughs> um, oh, <wait>. yeah <laughs> but um but but let's pray that God would already that he was would send us to people who are already searching and that he would then give us the wisdom to ask the right questions um and then that he would take it on from there mm. thank you that's a perfect note on which to end uh the importance of of having all these conversations in dependence on on god to guide us and to do the work uh, that only he can do um so uh with that i want to say a huge thank you to you uh julia for uh for uh guiding us through this area tonight uh and uh inspiring us with how we can rediscover the goodness of the gospel and, and share it with others and a thank you to everyone who was uh, with us tonight and uh, do uh, keep in touch with us. If you follow our newsletter, it might be a while now until we do our next webinar with the summer coming up, but do uh, stay in touch with us and we hope to see you next time.